Hey everyone, welcome to today's live stream. It is Saturday and I'm excited to be here with everyone. Hopefully you're enjoying a nice Saturday, relaxing, having some time off. I actually just got done a little over an hour ago and that's why I kind of pushed the stream back just a smidge today. I usually kind of try to host around 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm here today at 3 p.m. Standard Time because I was speaking at the Carolina Coders chapter for, I believe it's Chapel Hill, North Carolina, I want to say. I could be wrong on that, but they're a very big chapter in North Carolina. They were having a March Madness seminar today, which is why I turned also my lights in the back, if you see them, are green today instead of purple in honor of March Madness and St. Patrick's Day coming up. Really excited to be here with you guys today. Let's get started with the stream. So thank you everyone for coming in. There is a delay that actually happens with the stream. So I'm not even seeing any of my comments, even though I can see that you guys are out there right now. So I'm just going to wait a little bit till everyone gets in and just kind of go over a couple of things until we start getting some more viewers, unless three o'clock maybe is not a great time for everyone. Or maybe everyone who usually watches is still in on the uh, March Madness seminar that's going on today. So uh, yeah, I was really excited to talk to the Carolina coders. I've had some coders reach out recently to ask if I would speak at their chapter. So I've been doing chapter presentations for, oh my gosh, years now. I can't even tell you how many years. But uh, yeah, so if you're uh, affiliated with a certain chapter and you want me to come out and speak to your chapter, I do provide presentations to AAPC chapters. I do two chapters a month, so I want to make sure that I'm fair to everyone that is out there, and I provide two chapter, two chapters with a presentation every month. I try not to overload myself because they do happen a lot in the evening, and evenings are not always the best because, you know, I'm a mom and I have other things to do with my family. So... That is where that is going right now. So I'm excited to be here with everyone today. I have a question. Someone is on here. I have a question about understanding primary second diagnosis, but let me formulate my question. Sure, go ahead. I will see what I can do. If it's something that's kind of a long, complicated coding questions, I don't always go over those on the stream because it gets a little, it gets a little laggy if I start just looking up codes and looking up guidelines on the stream. So more of what I do here is if you have general questions about career stuff, if you have questions about where to get CEUs, if you have questions about what next credential should I get, is it worth it to get into auditing, what kind of study guides should I buy? Those are the questions that I really like to answer as well. And I wanted to mention something because this is, uh, well, there's a couple of hot things that happened this week. So first off, uh, there were updates to the evaluation and management coding guidelines. I think the AMA perhaps did not anticipate some of the creative interpretations that we're going to come across as we were looking through the notes, as we were starting to get more in depth and when we got the e &M changes implemented and then, you know, they were really taking a look at certain cases and providers were developing their own kind of interpretations or coders had areas where they're like, mm, this is still just a little bit ambiguous here. So the AMA revised the some of the sections of the e &M guidelines a couple of days ago. I'm hoping that I can get a chance either today or tomorrow to kind of look at those changes so I can do a video that speaks to those also because I have an e &M coding like on demand course that you can take. And I want to make sure that gets updated too now with the new guidelines. So that's it was a big thing. The other thing I want to mention because um, it looks like it's still uh, having issues is one of the CEU recommendations that I give to people is to go to the website hitnots.com. And it looks like unfortunately hitnots.com was the victim of some sort of hacking. So uh, be, don't, I don't want to say don't go to hitnots.com, but if you do be very careful when you're clicking on the links, because it looks like they're um, some not so great websites popping up when you click on some of the links there, at least until they can get the website corrected. So it might be a little bit until hitnots is really kind of back up and running. So 
So I have a question, testing this year, do you suggest printing the new e &M guidelines to study? I would definitely suggest printing the new e &M guidelines to study. They are in, so the thing about the e &M guidelines is the full guidelines I don't think are actually in the book for the office and outpatient stuff that's been updated. And you're still gonna need the 95 and 97 guidelines for anything that isn't office or outpatient. So let me see what we've kind of got here. Because if you look in your CPT book, they give some general information about how to score an E&M, but I don't think they're quite as in depth as the separate printed versions that the AMA makes publicly available on their website. So I, for studying purposes, I think it would be a great idea to go ahead and, um, and put those out there with the, where is my face? Whoop, there I am, <laughs> to, to print out the E&M guidelines for for studying purposes. So if any of you need to find the e &M guidelines, the AMA has theirs published online. Oop, I still have your, don't wanna keep the comment up there forever. The AMA website does have them available that you can download. So AMA e &M outpatient guidelines. Let's see if I can bring them up here for you. So, Let's see, AMA, e &M Outpatient Guidelines, and if I click here, does that take me to them? I think so, yes. And these are the ones that just changed, so I'm not sure. Oh, no, wait, this isn't them. That's a, okay. That's slides. Oh, here we go. So this document, yep, so this is the one that was just changed and they did update it. So this is one that you're gonna to wanna to get familiar with. It is kind of long, 28 pages. And then the old guidelines, I always like the ones that they have on Novatas, the 95 and 97 guidelines. Let's just search 1997 guidelines and hopefully it'll take us to my favorite website here where Novatas has all of these score sheets and guidelines information. You can also get this on the CMS website. I'm just not as familiar off the top of my head where it is there. So Novatas has them here. Here's their 1995 guidelines, the 1997 guidelines, and then all the specialty guidelines for 95 and 97. So people, I'm actually gonna make a video because this has been requested a couple of times, how, to do, how I do my laminated scorecards because I have, for all of my E&M stuff that I code, I have laminated scorecards and there's an easy way you can make these um, with a pretty, pretty cheap laminator from Amazon. So I'm gonna go over and do a video on that, how I get them from the websites, how I download them, print them out, laminate them, the whole shebang. Lots of questions coming in now. I'm glad you finally caught live. Yeah, I pushed it back just, all, just a smidge today. With all the changes in E&M, I don't understand why more providers don't document time in their notes. I mean, it kind of depends. Sometimes the amount of time that, I mean, time does, doesn't does always necessarily mean it's gonna be a higher level. Although there are probably some instances where I think providers are trying to pull and pull and pull something out of their medical decision-making um, and it really wouldn't be more advantageous. So it, it really kind of depends on the specialty and what the provider is doing. Do you have any exam advice for remembering the sequence of codes? Pay attention to what your book is telling you because, and I think this is in most editions, especially with, so CPT is kind of easy. The, the more severe CPT code is gonna be what gets sequenced first. It's really ICD-10-CM where you're gonna find more nuances in regards to sequencing guidelines and what goes first. But let's see if I can find something in here where I can kind of show you that a lot of the manuals do kind of help you out with sequencing guidelines. Let's see if I can find one in here to show as an example. Okay, so here's one. 
if we look in here, and I'll zoom this down a little bit, I need to get one of one of those cameras that's on more of a more bendable arm. But if you see here, all these codes for atherosclerosis, they have notations in here that says use additional code if applicable to identify chronic total occlusion of artery or extremity. So oftentimes when you're concerned about your sequencing and you look at one of the codes, it will tell you things like use an additional code. Use additional code means this additional code goes second. So this is your first code. Your additional code is going to go second. You'll also see notations that say code first. So if it says code first, that means you should be coding something else first. Um, you'll see that a lot with a lot of heart conditions, for example, have notes that say use an additional code for tobacco exposure. And that means that goes secondary. And first, it would be the heart condition. So really just pay attention to some of those notations in ICD-10-CM, because if you're looking at, you know, option A for the CPC exam says the exact same thing as option B, but the sequencing is different. You can look at some of them in the book and they may give you some guidance as far as what gets sequenced first, what gets sequenced second. Will I be talking about risk adjustment today? Not today, I'm not specifically gonna talk about risk adjustment, although I do have uh, some company announcements, I guess, about risk adjustment. My next risk adjustment boot camp that I'm having is going to be taking place April 10th and 11th. And the boot camp is kind of for people who already have training in medical coding, or they've been trained in maybe ICD 10 CM, and or they have an additional coding credential and they're looking for the CRC as a second credential. But what we do is just really focus on the risk adjustment portions of it. So we focus on the risk adjustment models, the frequently coded conditions, really narrow in on that diagnosis coding part of it, but not go over the ones that don't have HCCs or risk adjust as much, um, as well as quality measures, you know, MIPS, MACRA, APMs, STARS measures, focus on that part. And we leave out the stuff that you, you've already know if you have a basis in coding, you know, basics of ICD-10 CM. We don't talk about what a Medicare or Medicare Advantage is. Really just focus in on what you need to know for the CRC exam. So that's going to be April 10th and 11th. Also, I'm going to be updating my uh, full CRC course. So I have a full course available for the CRC if you need the whole expansive item thing. The full course... Um, so I'm, I'm revamping it, not because any of the material is outdated, but I've had some technology updates that I think are just going to make it look nicer versus some of the older videos that I have where I'm using virtual backgrounds and things. So I think just re-recording the videos with the better audio and so forth is just going to make it a, a little bit nicer than what I currently have. So I'm finishing up. I think I have about 200 more slides to record and then I can finish up uh, editing it and get that updated. Gemma says, I purchased the CPC review guide. It has a review assessment exam once you're done with all the review modules. It states that if I pass by 70%, I won't have to take the exam. That doesn't sound correct, um, at least not the certification exam. It might mean that you don't have to take the course final exam, but not necessarily this the certification exam. That's what I'm guessing they're probably going to refer to, like the course final exam versus not having to take the CPC exam. Why don't I use electronic coding books? That is a good question. So the funny thing is, is I actually have both versions of the CPC, the CPT book. I have both the print version and I have it in the electronic format. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of one of those funny things. It's, I've gotten the, I've, now that I've gotten the ebook of the CPT book, it doesn't look quite as, as the way I want it on my desktop. Like if I download it on Kindle, it looks okay, but on my desktop, it just doesn't quite look the same. And I like to be able to kind of show my, my written versions just for what I'm doing. If I write notes or actually highlight it, because I do have some teaching stuff that I do, um, where I show how to highlight things or underline things or notate things for those purposes. 
and it's harder to do those in electronic format. It's nicer to kind of show students who are learning in books how I also use those exact same paper books. But I do have I do have the electronic version of the, <laughs> the CPT book as well. Um, I do use also Codify through the AAPC. So I don't know if you guys know this. This is kind of a um, something I don't think we talk about too much with the AAPC instructor program stuff. But if you are an AAPC instructor, they give you access to AAPC Codify as part of being an instructor. So I do actually have Codify access as part of just my instructor uh, licensure. What is the best study guide for CRC? I am a CPC and I'm doing the risk adjustment course. So that is a great question. I don't, wait, hold on. There is, so there's two books for the risk adjustment for the CRC. There's this book, which is the full training book and they don't list this one on the website. So I think you might have to call the AAPC specifically if you want this CRC training book. And then they have a study guide that is basically an abridged version of this. I think it just has maybe 15% less content than the full training book. So that study guide I think is great. If you're just looking to get into risk adjustment, I don't think I have it here. It's over on my bookshelf, I don't wanna grab it. But there's a, a great book, Risk Adjustment, Documentation and Coding by Sherry Poe Bernard, and it is phenomenal, it is amazing. But if you're looking just to take your certification exam, you want the AAPC study guide. Reason being is although Sherry's book is a phenomenal resource, so amazing, definitely get it if you have the resources and funds available to have both of them. But the CRC study guide is really going to show you what it is they're going to test you on for the exam because there's a difference between risk adjustment projects. Some will take a history of, some won't take a history of, some will let you abstract certain diagnoses, some will say, oh, well, even if they say history of HIV, they're not cured from HIV, so you can still code HIV. And having the study guide is how you know exactly what way they're going to test you on the exam. So that's the the way you can, you can understand. Um, can I please pin it, meaning the CRC study guide? Yeah, let me get you the But yeah, that Sherry Poe Bernard book is good too. I think, I feel like I have it listed in my YouTube channel, but maybe not. Well, here is the AAPC CRT study guide. Sometimes it won't let me po post comments to certain outlets. So I don't know if that's gonna go through. And then this is the book that Sherry Poe Bernard did that is like phenomenal. And it is also available in um, ebook format as well. If you're interested in my CRC bootcamp, anyone at any point, I do include the ebook version of the CRC study guide. So you can get the ebook version of the CRC study guide. It goes into the AAPC, has an account with Bookshelf, and you can have it then on desktop. There's a mobile phone application that you can use to read the study guide there. And it downloads really nice on Amazon Kindle, which I love because do I have my Kindle here? Um, it just makes it really, really easy to read. Oh, it's not letting me post the link to Facebook for the Amazon thing. Or maybe it did. It kind of looks like it did and then it didn't. So I'm not quite sure that. Oh, my I, didn't, I apologize. I just realized the comment's still popping up there. Katie says, I'm taking a billion coding course. Love your videos. They help reinforce the materials a lot. That's great. Thank you so much for your wonderful comment, Katie. <laughs> so Barbara's asking about the book easel that I have. So if interesting thing about this. So this one that I have, because of what I personally do with YouTube, this is more so decorative. I wouldn't recommend buying this if you're actively coding. Reason being is if I'm trying to look up a code, the way that this one is, 
I can't open up the book because of this bar here. So mine's more so for just kind of like to get it off of my desk and set it there. It's actually a cookbook holder. So if you just go onto Amazon and you want something like this, I would just look for cookbook holder and you can find it there. Otherwise, what I've seen a lot of other people do is they have a book easel where the books are basically going this way and you can spin it around and open up the pages. I've even seen some uh, design, some that are like you can put three books on them. I'm trying to figure out a budget friendly way to make them myself. I've been hunting around at the Dollar Tree to see if I can find a cheap Lazy Susan and figure out like what I could maybe put in a like glue down to a Lazy Susan so that I could rotate my books around and I would just I would just need some kind of like triangle piece. But I can't find any Lazy Susans at the Dollar Tree. I might have to check like Dollar General or somewhere to um to see if maybe they have some available there instead. So to, cause I'd love to, cause they're expensive. Those little book carousels, they're like $70 or something. And if I could make them for like 10, that would be a fantastic video. Could you imagine like watching me go into like the dollar general and buy a lazy Susan and a couple pieces of wood and like hot gluing them together and making my own, my own book rotation. Christina says she's looking forward to starting her medical billing and coding program, but a little nervous too. It's exciting. Yeah, it's, it's exciting and new and nervousing. And um, I have a video that I think will particularly help where I talk about the CPT book in, partic CPT book in particular <laughs> and what's in it. And some people have said that that one's really helpful where I just kind of tell you like what is inside of the book. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa Lynn for the super chat. I didn't even see you comment. I uh, really appreciate everyone who has opted to donate through Super Chats, who has since, I don't know if I have Super Stickers set up, but also I appreciate just the likes, the thumbs up, the subscribers that come up. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please, I would love if you would subscribe to the channel. I think I just passed, what, 17,000 subscribers? It's crazy. Just taking a quick coffee break. I also have channel membership for those of you that are interested. So if you're interested in joining my YouTube channel membership, what it does is it gives you access to custom emojis, community only posts at gold membership. You get access to have your name added to the end credits of my videos at platinum membership. You also get behind the scenes footage and outtake videos. And some of them are pretty cute and pretty funny. Uh, do I offer tutoring? So I do offer tutoring. It is probably more expensive though than what you would find through a place like Wisent or tutors.com. Reason being is that typically when people are asking me to tutor, it's because they are specifically looking for me and I come with such a breadth of knowledge and background having worked for very large academic institutions, having worked with thousands of providers and so forth that I do offer tutoring, tutoring in a very limited amount, but it is uh, much more pricey than you would probably be able to get someone else for a tutor. What book bag would you recommend for carrying all the ICD-10 CPT and HICPICS books? It gets really heavy. So let me actually show you what I have. I'm going to, I'm going to do something I haven't done before. I'm going to go behind the curtain. So back there is my, my junk closet. I haven't had to use this in a while, except for when I was taking my COC exam. But this is one of the carrying cases. And this is what I, I would recommend. I don't think it's a good idea to carry all of the books in a book bag. This is the Amazon Basics version of their, their carry-on bag. So you can, like a luggage bag. And I've even used this to carry around my projector when I do on-site presentations, which I haven't done in a while, but it is very sturdy. It will definitely hold your bags. It will prevent you from having shoulder strain and back strain because they are incredibly heavy. 
but that's what I utilize. There's even a little pocket in here to put your laptop in it so you can fasten it in and it's a little bit more shock absorbent. So I could take my, my spare laptop and strap that in there if I need it. It's very nice. I would definitely recommend getting something that's more the style of a luggage carrier versus just a backpack. But yeah, the Amazon Basics one I think is fine. Um, I used to, I used to, this is funny. I used to teach at a local technical school. Oh gosh, we're talking uh, over a decade ago. And the first book bag, book carrier that I had that was that style, I actually broke. And it, and it was like dragging across the floor because at the time I, I was, you know, early on in my career and couldn't afford a new bag. And it just broke and was just dragging along the floor, like scraping everything as it was going for a while. You finished school last month and you have not yet scheduled your CPC exam. When would you recommend that you take the CPC exam? So this is my recommendation. I think um, one of the best ways to assess if you're prepared for the CPC exam is to buy some practice examinations. The AAPC, I think, has either six versions or nine versions. They're lettered, so I'm not quite sure how exactly how many. Take the practice examinations, time yourself. If you don't want to sit through the whole 150 questions at a time, I would actually probably not recommend you don't. Time about 50 questions. You should finish 50 questions in about 113 minutes or so. If you can finish 50 questions in 113 minutes and get an 80%, you're good to go. Anything less than that, you can still test, but it's going to be a little bit more closer, at least for my comfort. I would take maybe three different practice exams, the 50 question ones, go through all of those, maybe at subsequent times, maybe if you want to space it out, do three of them throughout the day, if you want to do three of them throughout the week, whatever is comfortable for you. But I would aim to do 115, 113, 115 minutes for 50 questions and get an 80%. That to me, it would be a very comfortable threshold that would show that you are prepared for the CPC exam. The other thing, if you take 50 questions and you're not doing as well, really look at that question rationale. Look at the ones that you didn't get right. Look at the rationale and really understand what it was that you missed and how you can improve on that. And then maybe even if you take the practice exam a second time and then you're doing better, that shows you really absorbed what the changes were and what the rationale was and that you're more comfortable now with that particular guideline or coding scenario. So Honey York is saying, anyone else having swelling on the right side from all the mouse use? I have used three different mice and I can't figure out what to do. I've been stuck in the third of four modules for about four months. Wow, that's that's tough. Um, yeah, if you're having mouse problems, I know there are more ergonomic mice. Um, the other consideration might just be not necessarily the mouse, but how is your arm maybe elevated in comparison to the mouse? I know there are with coders and just with computer use in general, a lot of considerations in ergonomics. So might be worthwhile to maybe even talk to your provider or physician and see if there's something that they can recommend for you. Mary Small is asking, are employers more likely to hire a new coder if they have CRC and CPC without experience? I find it hard to find anyone that's willing to hire a CPCA. And the CPCA positions are a, a little bit harder to come by. Um, I've known People that have said that CPCA, it seems like that A is like their scarlet letter. It's harder to, to uh, utilize that versus just being a CPC. And that's why people like to go and have their practicode taken and they can get their apprenticeship removed by meeting the practicode and meeting the 80 course hours or contact hours to remove the apprentice status. It's kind of hard to say these days. Um, there might be certain projects 
that a CRC will qualify you for because of the fact that it is more isolated. It's just ICD-10 coding versus CPT and ICD-10. So I think to certain employers, it would definitely look better as far as just generally speaking. Um, you know, the, the hoarding of credentials, so to speak, might not necessarily be the only solution. I would look more so into things like getting your apprentice status removed, having someone review your resume. Um, even, I know like um, renowned talent has started doing coaching services as well. So that might be something else to look into. And even just things like tracking your applications where you've applied to, and if you heard back, you didn't heard, hear back, etc. cetera. Um, and just maybe even, even things like the AAPC has a mentorship program. So that might even be something to look into. That way, maybe they could partner you with someone who is willing to work on your job search with you. Because with the mentorship program, they, always, they don't always necessarily... How do I put this? They don't always necessarily teach you coding. Like you can't get partnered up with someone who's like, I want you to teach me everything you know about cardiology, but they'll help you with things like your resume, your job skills, your soft skills. So that might be something to look into as well. The AAPC mentorship program. Do the ethics and guidelines need to be memorized? If you're referring to like the AAPC membership ethics, code of ethics and guidelines, um, that doesn't need to be memorized. But if you're talking about your coding guidelines, you don't have to memorize even your coding guidelines. Just knowing a familiarity with them is probably the best. <coughs> SpongeBob, you're back today. I have taken two hours on 20 questions before and would score like 16 out of 20 for my CBT class last semester. By the end, I was more around 18, 20, and one for two hours of time. Yeah, you know, it's it's like anything medical coding. You kind of got to keep practicing at it, practicing at it, practicing at it. Hey, Brian, good to see you here. Happy Saturday to you too. Kristen, good to have you here too taking a small break and watching this before sitting down for their chapter five exam. It's a little overwhelming. You know what the most, the most, um, the most complicated one I hear from coders is they say that that cardiology chapter, which I think is chapter seven in the CPC program. That's no 10. I think it's chapter 10. That's the one that gives everyone the problem, but it's cardiology. <sighs> So ZZ, that is a great question and one that I actually can sort of provide an answer to. And she's asking, have you ever heard of not meeting components for a 99222, but instead coding for a newer established visit versus 99232? What I've heard in the past, and I've had one Medicare rep tell me that you should not do that excuse me, I've heard one Medicare rep say that you should not do that, but I've heard of just about everyone else from Medicare say to do it. So the 99222 code, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a hospital admission code. And in order to bill a lot of times the higher levels of hospital admissions, you have to take a full history and a full examination on the patient, which can be <laughs> a little funny when you have a patient that's 90 years old and coming in for a stroke and being admitted to the hospital. And, you know, there's that medical necessity to meet the 99222 or 99223. And, you know, is it really pertinent to get the patient's family history when they're 90 years old and coming in for a stroke? Um, but in any case, you need to have that done to bill a 99222 or 99223, which are higher level hospital admission codes. If you don't miss all the components for a higher for the hospital admission codes, typically what happens is you uh, drop it down to a subsequent visit, which would be like a second or third day, fourth day until the patient's discharged. They're not reimbursed as high as a hospital admission, but it's better than billing nothing at all. So I've heard of that. Uh, I've done that for a long period of time. I have heard a couple of opinions that have said, you know, you, you shouldn't do that um, very rarely. 
But my philosophy has been, and what I've heard from a lot of other industry leaders, a lot of other consultants, a lot of Medicare training sessions even, is that if you don't meet the criteria for a hospital admission, you bump it down to a subsequent visit. The only time I would ever see dropping it to a new or established patient for an office visit would be if it was maybe an observation patient. So in that case where we maybe didn't meet observation or they weren't formally admitted or something, I could maybe see that, but um, I wouldn't see that being a common occurrence. Emily, thank you for the wonderful comment. She says, no question, just wanted to say thanks for helping me believe in myself that I can do this. You are so welcome, Emily. I'm glad for you. As an offshore service provider, where can I get clients stateside? Sorry, I don't work um, with a lot of international stuff. So because I've been domestic for my entire career, I unfortunately don't know a lot of uh, accessibility for, for how that kind of works out. When coding from scratch, I struggle with what details to code, other diagnoses, history, status, and what is not relevant to code, any tips? Um, that would be something that I kind of have to walk through in a case scenario sort of thing. So I don't think there's really any tips I can give without specifically looking at a case and walking through it. It's not like, a, oh, we'll look for this. You don't look for this. This doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. Um, that might be something that maybe you need a tutor to help with. So you could look for like tutors.com or wisent.com or even see if there's something that is maybe offered by your local chapter association because that's really, really, really going to be a case by case type of thing. You guys love Kenny G, really? <laughs> you know what? That reminds me of something interesting, though. I heard a really interesting statistic lately that said that if you are looking to pick up productivity, pick up pace, like if you're studying or um, working on something where you need to like really focus and kind of get revved up to do it, that the best thing to listen to is video game music, like that really upbeat, you know, like the backgrounds for Mega Man and Super Mario and stuff, because that kind of gets you pumped up, like you're getting ready to go. And that's supposed to be, <laughs> that's supposed to be one of the things that's supposed to help people is listening to, to video game music. And that does kind of make sense because it also doesn't have lyrics. That's one of the things that I find I get distracted with is if, oftentimes if I'm putting on music or even a podcast and I'm trying to code a case, I have to pause it because my brain is thinking about the podcast or the lyrics to the music and not about what I'm trying to code. So yeah, Gemma, I would I would say apparently the the update is to go to to listen to video game upbeat video game music like that electronic east type stuff when you <laughs> when you're trying to pump out codes. Let's see. <clears throat> but yeah, so I've been working a lot on getting the CRC course updated. Uh, so hopefully I will have that done. I'm hoping by the end of next week. I hit a, a snag, actually. I have been trying really hard to not want to do everything myself and try to outsource little bits where I can. And I thought that the video recording that I did of my courses could be easily edited by someone else. Cause usually I go through and edit the whole video myself. I do all my own video editing, but I'm like, Oh, well the course won't be too bad. You just need to like cut out the portions portions where I'm pausing. Or if I mess up the slide, you know, you just have to cut that part out and start back up where I start up again and reread, you know, or go over the slide again. And, um, and, um, yeah, I tried having someone do it. And the first version that he sent me for the the edits that I was paying him to do, he did this weird morph thing. So when I'm doing my, my courses, I do kind of like I do here, like here would be like my slide and I am in the corner of it. Or if I'm blocking something, 
I'll remove my face entirely so you can see what's going on here. And then maybe I'll talk and I'll be like, blah, 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 blah. And then back to the slide and then I'll do a talk and then back to the slide. And he did this weird morph thing where he, well, like I was talking and then it, he cut part of it out. And instead of just jump cutting it, whereas you just like, you cut the middle of this part out that I've messed up. He did this weird like transformation morph where it was like my face was going like, and then going back into the next scene. I'm like, what the heck is that? Like people are going to be like, what kind of cheesy, cheap, crappy course did you put together that you're doing these like morphing things and weird transitions? And I'm like, look, you can't, you can't do that. Can you, can you fix these and then show me again what it is? So he fixed out and took all the weird morphy transitions and sent it back to me. And then he missed one of the parts. I, like I was just spot checking a couple minutes and he missed one of the parts where I like stopped in the middle of the slide and was like, oh, I messed that up and started again. And I'm like, I'm not going to rewatch 12 hours of edited videos to make sure you don't mess, mess all of them up. So yeah, so now I have to go back to doing all of my editing because I just had trouble outsourcing. So it's going to put things back a little bit. I'm getting some of my updates done. <sighs> So Christina says, my goal is to sit for the CPC in December or early January. Would I have to get the 2022 books? Would it be okay for me to use my ADA accommodations? So it looks like there's, there's really two components here to this question. First is the books and then is the ADA accommodations. So as far as the ADA accommodations, those all have to get approved through the AAPC. Currently, I don't believe they have them for the online option. If you're looking for online by December or January, they might have something set up, but currently I don't believe they do. By then, I would, I would hope that they would for online. But what I like to refer to people for the book question is AAPC exam FAQ. So if you go into Google and type in AAPC exam FAQs, It'll be the first thing I think that pops up here. So here under the AAPC's exam certification FAQs, it says what year's books should I use? And it basically tells you that they highly encourage you to use the current year's books. So if you're testing in 2022, it would be very much recommended to use 2022 books, but they'll still let you use 2021. Um, you just have to understand that some of those questions may have changed between now and then. So if you're testing in 2022, there's going to be a lot of code updates. Um, and I can show you even in the CPT book, I'll show you. Because there's an appendix that has all of the code updates. So Appendix B in your CPT book is all of your updates. Flip, flip, flipping all around here. So this is Appendix B and these are all the code updates. So you can see this appendix is a fair amount of code updates. And every year the codes update. So there's new ones in here. So the, the question then becomes between one year to the next, how much are they really going to change on the exam that one of these codes that was changed is going to appear on the 150 questions that you have in your CPC exam? So how much risk are you really, really willing to take that maybe one of the, you know, 300 CPT codes that they've updated and 2000 ICD 10 CM codes that they've updated are going to be out of the, you know, how many tens of thousands of codes that we have. I think there's more than 75,000 ICD 10 CM codes right now. So maybe they update, you know, 600 next year. You know, what is the risk that one of those 600 questions out of 750,000 plus are going to be the ones that are on your 150 question exam? So Codes don't change. Uh, so the codes update every January 1 for CPT and codes update October 1 for ICD-10-CM. The exam changes on January 1 of every year. So all of the code changes that happen yearly are going to be on the exam starting January 1 of that year. 
So it's not that they change them from month to month. It's that January one they change. So if you take it in January of 2022, it'll all be based off of 2022 updates, not on, not on 2021. So there is a little bit of a risk that one of those codes that's updated from 2021 to 2022 is going to be in your book if you take it in 2022. So I guess that's kind of a long way of saying try to take it in December if you can, because that way they haven't updated the exam and you can still use your 2021 books. Melanie is asking, do you need to memorize codes or do you always have your books handy when pulling in codes? I have a brain disorder, so my memory is not so great. Yeah, don't worry, my memory is not so great either. So good news, you do not have to memorize all of the codes. Um, there are, like I said, for ICD-10-CM, there's over 75,000 codes. So there would be absolutely no way humanly possible that you would have to memorize them all. Your employer will equip you with either code books or an encoder program. And I might be able to kind of show you a little bit of the one I have. <clears throat> Let's see, let me get logged in here. So yeah, employers will either give you books. Occasionally they may tell you to purchase your own books. Most employers will equip you with something or they'll give you access to an encoder program, which kind of is more of a lookup tool. Depending on the encoder program, they'll sometimes lead you through to select a code. I've worked with like 3M encoder before that will guide you to like a CPT code that you can type in stomach and it'll take you to like, okay, well, was it a excision, incision, biopsy, laparoscopic, open, etc. And you can start typing in, you know, it was a uh, incision or a laparoscopic and it'll help kind of through those prompts, help you pick what they think is the right code and you can kind of verify it and go, oh yeah, that's, that's right. But one of the things I have as an instructor is a PC Codify. I'll get in here. I can kind of show you. So I have, this is my Codify. It is a code lookup tool. Yeah, let's close that out. And I can look up, let's see here, sepsis. And it'll help me find some of the ICD-10-CM codes for sepsis just through the terminology of looking it up. And I can look up potentially codes that way, or I could look up, let's see if I can find a code for a uh, skin tag removal. And it'll help me find the codes that way. And I can look up here and see, oh, is this the code that I'm looking for? It'll give me the lay terms of this. So in plain terms, what does that mean when we have a skin tag removal or when we bill for 11200? So they'll equip you with, with tools that are like that in most cases. Yes, yeah, SpongeBob says you're always gonna have your books handy. My computer is glitching a little bit. Uh, you always have your books handy to search the codes. I don't remember any of the codes. I used to, I used to have a lot more codes memorized in ICD-9 than I do now in ICD-10. A lot more of the skin codes that I used to have memorized that I don't anymore. Excuse me a minute. Danelle saying she is often 360 expert. Is Codify better or what? I think they're pretty comparable. They may have different features. And also, um, depending on what subscription plan you have, you might get different features. So there's a version of Codify that is the I don't know what they call it. It's not perfect code lookup tool type thing where it just basically gives you the CPT code descriptions and ICD-10 code descriptions. It doesn't give you like the lay terms. It doesn't give you CCI edit lookups. So it really depends on what package you have. I've used some of the Optum 360 programs before and I think they're pretty great. So likely they're, they're fairly comparable. <laughs> BJ's asking, what's the drink that I have? It's just coffee. It's just plain coffee. It's just in my beaker mug right now. Oh, excuse me a second. I think I might have to sneeze. Nope, I'm okay. <laughs> I take my test in two weeks. Do you recommend jumping around and doing a certain section first? So that's a great question. 
my thought process is when I took my exam in person, I wish I had one of the test bubble sheets here to show you, but I don't. When I took my exam in person, I skipped around a lot and I finished with like one minute to spare for my CPC exam. I think it's good to jump around, particularly because there are certain questions that they're going to ask you that are just going to be, you know it or you don't, especially things like maybe midterm. You could probably answer that a lot faster than you can a three page operative report, right? So I think it's good to skip around, but just be cautious because if you're filling in your sample uh, grid, your little exam bubbles, and you go, oh, I'm going to skip question six and go on to seven. Remember to leave six blank and then fill in seven for the next answer, because otherwise you're going to have your grid all discombobulated. Uh, let's see if I can find a copy of it to show you guys. I think they have one in here. Yes. So in case any of you haven't seen it, this is one of, this is a sample of it. Let's see if I can zoom it in a bit. This is a sample of what your grid is going to look like when you fill it in for any of the AAPC exams. They'll give you section A's and B's with your names and did you go to school? And then you'll have to fill in your exam type, the version, the exam number, and your member ID number, which is on a sticker on your package. And then you'll have to fill in these bubble grids. So what I'm saying is if you go in and you're filling in, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then you go, oh, I'm going to skip this one and come back. Just remember that you leave this blank and don't accidentally move on to question six and then start filling it in the question five spot because that would <laughs> mess up your whole grid. And I've done that before and gotten like two or three down and went, oh, crap, and had to erase them all and put them back in. So that's the one caution that I would give everyone is just be careful if you're going to skip around. The person at the, uh, when I took my exam, um, not that I was looking at the person in front of me's paper, <coughs> excuse me, but, um, and it wouldn't have done any good because everyone gets, a lot of people get different versions. There's multiple versions of the CPC exam, which is why you can see on the grid here, excuse me one second, I have to spray my throat. <coughs> Uh, ugh, sorry, I was talking a lot today. Um, but yeah, you can see on the grid here that, that you have to put on your version, your exam type and version. So there's multiple versions of the CPC exam. If you take it a second time, you're probably not going to get the same version. Person sitting next to you or in front of you is not going to get the same version. So the person in front of me I could see she was just going right down the row, right down the row. And I've seen that even proctoring before that some people will just go right down the row. It really depends on your style. <coughs> really, excuse me one second. I'm going to mute myself. There we go. Oh, excuse me for that. Christina's saying... I'm new here. I love your videos. I finished my CPC course at the end of February. I'm going to take the CPC exam on April 3rd. You're so nervous. Don't be nervous. You'll be fine. Um, I've been talking to some other people here. You know, if you were doing your practice exams, you're finishing on time, you're getting an 80%, you're probably going to be good to go. That's what I would recommend to you. Um, are you taking it online or in person? Let me know. Speaking of online exams, I've been getting a lot of questions about that lately. And I don't have any more information than, <coughs> than what's been made publicly available that they're hoping end of second quarter. But I will tell you guys, HealthCon is at the end of this month. It's at what? The 28th or 29th, I think it starts. And oftentimes at HealthCon, that's when the AAPC makes their like big announcements of all the new stuff coming up. So make sure you pay attention at the end of this month because if they're going to make any updates as far as online exams, new products, um, new courses they're offering, anything like that, my guess would be they're going to announce it at the end of the month for HealthCon. Exam is open book, right? I'm trying to remember a previous video where you mentioned one book is allowed but not the other. Are we allowed to label our book's pages? So yeah, uh, it depends on what exam you're taking. So the CPC exam, you get three books. You get your CPT book, you get your 
I see a 10 CM book and there's different versions. And you have your Hickpix book. I don't use Hickpix too often, so mine is an old one. It's a 2018. The one thing I will tell you about the CPC exam is you have to have this version of the CPT book. This is the only one you're allowed to have um, this type. So you, it has to be the AMA version, the official AMA professional edition of CPT. You can have any choice of ICD-10 or HCPCS you want, but the CPT has to be that exact AMA professional edition. If you're taking your CRC course, though, that's when you're only allowed your ICD-10-CM book. So it depends on what certification you're taking. But yeah, you're allowed to label your books. You're allowed to label your pages. And I can actually show you where you can find that too. Let's see. Because that's important to know. This is... <clears throat> Basically, you're allowed to write anything except for practice questions in your book or exam questions or or you're not allowed to white out large portions of your book. So if you look here in the exam FAQs, it says what's allowed in our books. So handwritten notes are acceptable in the coding books if they pertain to daily coding activities. Questions from the study guide, practice exams, or the exam itself are prohibited. So if you take the exam one time, you're not allowed to write those questions from the exam in your book and then take it a second time is basically what that's saying. And no study guide or exam questions. You can insert tabs. You can paste staple the uh, tabs in as long as it shows that you're just earmarking a page. What you can't do is use sticky notes. You can't use sticky notes as tabs and then write extra stuff on there so that you can kind of add additional information and in by using the sticky notes. They have to be proper tabs. Let's see if I have any in here. I haven't tabbed my book yet for this year. Nope. But you're allowed to use. Let's see if I have them. Yep, I moved them. But yeah, any of the tabs that are just kind of clearly tabs, not just post it notes. So the ones that they're just like maybe like that big by that big, and you're you're just clearly showing to that you're tabbing the page, not just to add additional paper in there to write notes. So you're not allowed to alter the book or white out things. I've had actually a couple people ask recently about the coils on the book. So someone asked like, I don't like the way these are and that they're not sturdy. Can I take out the coils, hole punch them and put them in a binder? I would be very cautious about doing that because I think that might constitute altering your book. But what you can do is I've seen people take rubber bands. I've seen people take tape or even um, zip ties and just basically fasten these two parts together and fasten them up here and then they won't slide off of the coils. So yeah, no, no whiting out pages. I mean, it's one thing if you're writing like a note and you're like, oops, I wrote it wrong. And you, you go, there's my white out and rewrite it. Uh, you're just not allowed to white out an entire page. There were some issues in the past with that. Um, but yeah, and you're also not allowed to staple anything in your book. You're not allowed to leave post-its with notes in your book. You're not allowed to have pasted or stapled extra pages on top of other pages, anything like that. <clears throat> Someone's asking, is the AAPC CPC preparation course for beginners or for people already in the medical field? So if we're talking about, uh-oh, I hope I didn't log that out, okay. So if we're talking about the AAPC's preparation course, we have here CPC prep course. So let's take a look. So this course here is for beginners. So the one thing though that you do want to consider is if you're buying like the CPC prep course, like these whole bundles, That's the exam bundle, exam practice exam. If you're buying one of the bundles, where are they? Certification, certified professional coder. 
Maybe I was looking at the right thing. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Exam bundle. That's not right. Study guide and exam review. Oh, certification. Maybe it's under training. Here we go. Why am I not finding it? That's weird. Education. There we go. CPC exam training. That's what I'm doing wrong. So the training bundles that they have. What the heck? Why is this going all crazy? There we go. Goodness gracious. So what I'm going to say about the APC training is that in order to be a successful coder, you have to know medical terminology and you have to know um, anatomy and physiology. So it is for beginners, but if you haven't taken med term and you haven't taken anatomy, you would want to start here versus going straight to medical coding. Pathophysiology, I think, is another great thing for you to take. I know a lot of coders that have gone through without taking PATH or without even taking pharmacology, but bare minimum, you would want to know med term and anatomy, and then you can start learning medical coding. So that's what I would start looking at there. So if you're a brand new beginner and you don't know anything about the healthcare industry, make sure that you learn med term and anatomy at least before getting into the just CPC training programs without med term and anatomy. So this is the last question that I'm going to take today, and it's from Scott, and it says, what would you recommend for a refresher program for coding if your credential is back in 2019 and you haven't done any coding since? So my suggestion would be look into cco.us because what they have is called this Blitz program. And, you know, if you haven't coded since 2019, you're not going to need a full medical coding course, right? But you might need something more than a review. And they have a blitz program that's kind of in between those two. So it's not a full course. It's not a just a review. It's kind of a little bit more than a review, but not as much as a course. So that's a good option if you're looking for something that is kind of in the middle there. I also offer a review, but it's more so for if you're getting ready to take your CPC exam and you need a refresher and a practice exam versus, you know, a whole medical coding review. But that is another option depending on kind of how in depth you want to get. So thank you everyone for coming today to uh, my AMA. I will be back here next week. I believe, I believe next Saturday we'll be back at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time to answer questions and I'm going to take this last one because someone's asking whiting out is not allowed in the book. What kind of whiting out? So if you are writing a note and you have a little piece that you wrote wrong and you have to white out that little bit, you're not just not allowed to white out like half a page, a quarter a page, a whole page. You can't take like your, like this advertisement page here and you can't just white it out and write notes in it. There's whole sections for you to, to write notes in, in your coding books. So if it's like a little mistake that you white out, that's one thing. Whiting out an entire page is uh, wholly another. But yeah, um, and then to quick answer the question about anatomy and physiology, the anatomy and physiology are separate from the CPC course. So you do have to pay separately for the anatomy and physiology, med term, et cetera, et cetera, versus CPC. So thank you everyone so much for coming today. I am so excited to spend my Saturdays here doing AMAs and ask me anything. Uh, if you haven't already subscribed to the YouTube channel, head on over. There's lots more videos coming up, lots of exciting things going on over there. But for now, you guys, hey, just keep on coding on.